Good afternoon to everybody. I would like to present myself. I'm Anita Kuch and I would like to thank you uh, for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's a nice conference and I think that these two days is a nice opportunity for the students at every level of higher education, bachelor, master and PhD to exchange ideas. Um, and uh, this is the last panel, and this last panel is about the post-Cold War realities. Um, and uh, I know being the last means some responsibility, so you have to be sharp and disciplined. Um, everybody's getting tired, but in that case, um, we have, I think, very interesting topics to, to hear in very interesting lectures. Um, Maybe I should be more modest, but I think the whole point of these two days was, was uh, about this last panel. So, because it's, it's about our own age. And I think um, history uh, is very important. And one of the most important points of history is that it can show us something of our own age. We can understand better our own age and um, the, the reality which we live in. Mm -hmm. So, of course, history can tell us everything about uh, post-World War reality, but it can show us the, the origins of the problems. And in, here I mean problems with capital letters of our own age and uh, uh, the main highlights, the main tendencies. So, um, Post-Cold War really is about a new international system, about the international system of globalization, which has a lot of new and interesting features. And globalization can present dangers and can offer us opportunities as well. And um, this is uh, what about our um, first lecture. And uh, the first lecture is about how to deal with these dangers in the case of Hungary. And uh, for me it's very interesting because uh, uh, the first <coughs> lecture can, uh, or presentation can, can show us a very interesting feature of globalization. It's very fascinating that a PhD candidate from the University of Toronto, originally Canada. Oh, Trento. Uh, Trento, I'm yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Oh, Originally well. from uh, Canada, um, can talk about us, the Hungarian security challenges. So the floor is yours. Okay. <laughs> I think it's safe to say that Anita hasn't put too much pressure on the last panel with that statement, but um, <laughs> inevitably this is all going to end up on the floor, so I have to move it. Thanks. Uh, okay. Can I leave it like this? Is that is that okay? Yeah. Okay. Great. So, right. I can uh, I can attempt to speak about uh, Hungarian uh, security policy, more uh, specifically counterterrorism policy. Um, this uh, this research um, is a, a chapter in my uh, uh, of my PhD thesis. Um, so it really. It's difficult to make it a standalone uh, piece, but um, it's embedded in a, in a much um, broader project that looks at the intersection between <clears throat> uh, counterterrorism policy and civil society, um, and it builds on the uh, on the now growing but still um, uh, lacking literature on this uh, this relationship. Um, most notably, uh, Jude Howell and Jeremy Lind have written considerably on um, CSOs, counter, civil society organizations, and counterterrorism uh, post 9/11. Uh, Bloodgood um, and uh, Whitaker have also written on the uh, exportation of the Patriot Act uh, and the uptake of counterterrorism policy. So, this chapter on Hungarian security policy, uh, most notably CT. Uh, policy fits within this this larger project, and um, uh, in the I guess what you want to term the age of globalization, uh, an unfortunate uh, and maybe inevitable offshoot of of that is what we find ourselves in 
uh, being dubbed the age of counterterrorism. Um, rather, uh, whether you want to say it trendy or fashionable for governments to um, revise, uh, formulate, implement new terror counterterrorism legislation, policies, measures, and institutes. Um, this is uh, this has been quite um, uh, an explosive area in the past uh, fifteen plus years. And uh, I hate to keep track. Of um, and indeed, almost uh, immediately after the events of 9-11, of, uh, governments around the world began to pass um, quite sweeping uh, counterterrorism legislation uh, with the stated intention of strengthening uh, national security and protecting states uh, and citizens from violent terrorist attacks. And uh, in the decade that followed 9-11, more than 140 countries worldwide passed new um, counterterrorism uh, legislation and brought new austere measures into practice. And in some countries, more than one measure had been passed and older legislation was uh, revisited and revised and designed uh, as part of comprehensive uh, counterterrorism uh, frameworks. And with some countries, most notably the United States and the United Kingdom, uh, revising and implementing and designing new CT measures, uh, it was... Um, there's a new platform that was developed for the uptake of counterterrorism measures by other countries uh, all around the world. Depending on 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 how you how you look at it, uh, more discon, uh, disconcertingly, developing states, developing nations with weaker uh, weaker democratic institutions, possibly stronger authoritarian uh, bases or institutions or governance. And uh, the revision of old laws and the drafting of new legislation in all 140 countries, now more than 140 countries, I'm sure, um, however, don't share a common motivation. Uh, it's certainly not uh, the um, mitigation of terrorism or the prevention of terrorism. And uh, while the effects of 9-11 terrorist attacks provided an initial push for countries to become more vigilant in, uh, in this new counterterrorism landscape and, and the new global <coughs> global security environment, some countries introduced uh, counterterrorism amendments and measures uh, because they were direct targets of minor and major attacks. Some countries weren't the target of attacks at all. Other countries acted in accordance with and under the guidance of United Nations security resolutions, uh, being part of the UN system for a long time. Maybe you could say there was a, a responsibility or a pressure there to for the uptake of counterterrorism uh, measures, uh, many of which were passed uh, during the 1990s, or, or a lot of which were passed during the 90s. Uh, further resolutions were passed right after the Twin Towers were attacked, and the Pentagon was attacked, um, and more still have been passed uh, to the present present day. And um, often with the passing of resolutions and strategies by what, and I take this word with a grain of salt, credible organizations like the United Nations or NATO, uh, or the EU and EU member states, there's a, a positivity, an inherent good in comprehensive programs and strategies, at least a perception that there's a positivity or, or, or some sort of perceived good in building, designing, and implementing uh, sweeping counterterrorism frameworks and measures with the aim of securing the state and securing citizens. Uh, however, at the same time, securitizing many other things within the state at the same time at the same time. And um, we now tend to, I think, as practitioners and scholars, uh, and indeed regular regular citizens, regular people, we tend to uh, take these strategies and these programs for granted with little regard for other actors, um, notably nation states, uh, principally the United States and the United Kingdom, for what their role might be in exporting or helping other countries to import counterterrorism policies. Both were major uh, uh, victims, targets of major terrorist attacks, and fear that subsequent and possibly larger scale attacks could occur. And I think this pushed other countries to rush in the implementation and enforcement of new and restricted anti-terrorism policy. Now, much has been written about the development of recent counterterrorism measures by states in Europe and part of the European Union and countries 
uh, such as the US and the UK, France and Israel most notably, have really reserved disproportionate attention, while other countries have been uh, inadequately engaged. Uh, Hungary is certainly, in my opinion, one of them. The relevant literature on Hungary's security, defense, and policies and institutions, uh, as well as the scope and the nature of its uh, security roles at home and abroad, have received relatively uh, little attention, even within communities of Hungarian academics and professionals. Uh, and I think with that, there's a need for Hungary to be factored into the existing literature with the aim of underscoring the politics that lies behind the formulation and uh, enforcement of counterterrorism uh, laws and policies that continue to emerge and really continue to have, if this isn't entirely observed across the board, implications on state-society relations. And this is how this fits into my uh, the, the broader research, my thesis. What are those implications on state-society relations in Hungary? Uh, and more specifically, what are the implications of counterterrorism policies on policies on civil society organizations and NGOs in Hungary. Um, as a side note, um, Spain uh, in the literature, um, Colas uh, wrote uh, on the Spanish case in the aftermath of the 2004 Madrid bombings <coughs> and uh, other terrorist threats that uh, Spain was politics as usual. The Spanish government didn't turn to any exceptional measures. They didn't revise any existing counterterrorism measures. They didn't implement any new counterterrorism or security measures. In fact, all they did was enhance the existing uh, existing framework, the legal uh, the legal frame framework um, in in uh, Spain. Uh, in Tanzania, uh, a case for concern given its. Uh, its uh, political, social, and economic history. The implementation of very strict, sweeping counterterrorism laws that were quite repressive served as a spark for civil society movements in the country, uh, something that I think caught uh, a lot of people uh, by surprise and certainly uh, captured the attention of scholars who, who began looking at how counterterrorism policies and their implementation repressive or not, can have uh, different impacts on the countries in which they're, they're uh, enacted. Uh, so this chapter, this, this, uh, this study, um, examines the evolution of Hungary's security policy and the subsequent development of its counterterrorism initiatives. Um, I'm addressing this small gap in the literature. Uh, certainly, I'm not going to <laughs> make that claim where I, I, I fill this gap. I try to avoid those... those uh, sweeping statements, but I want to address what I think is a, an existing gap in the literature on Hungarian security, security policy, uh, and in a broader socio-political uh, context of, of the Hungarian state. And so I turn to, um, I, I look at the approximately four decades of communist rule by elites in Soviet Russia, there, where there's, which helps produce a considerable gap between Hungary's democratic transition an eventual formulation of a more concrete security policy of its own. Uh, Hungary's uh, CT laws and policies have begun to materialize only in the last decade. Um, and uh, Hungary is certainly among uh, over a dozen other European countries that, that have really turned to rather quickly strict counterterrorism uh, measures. Um, but despite the prevalence of terrorism and terrorist threats in and across Europe, Hungary has not experienced any domestic terrorist attacks. Now, I know there are some detractors, there could be some detractors of this statement claiming one or two minor incidences. Of course, this is, uh, uh, this is sketchy ground. Uh, now, this is a, a high degree of subjectivity that comes into play whether you want to um, label some of these acts as domestic terrorism or not. Uh, it depends on, on which documents or which, which lens you're looking through. Of course, the government would be quick to, to uh, allege that some of these are domestic terrorism. However, there's no presence of uh, international terrorist cells, as far as we know. Maybe that's not true. Um, and in this chapter, I explore the changing security landscape in Hungary, Hungary roughly speaking from the period of Hungary's democratic transition. Uh, when it broke away from communism through the 1990s, the first decade of the 21st century, and right up until 2017. Now, why this time period the most important is 2017, uh, simply because this falls within the confines of my, my PhD program. More importantly, my PhD funding. 
because once the funding ends, life ends, basically. Um, what happens after 2017? I, I, I won't touch, I don't know. Um, but uh, Hungary's been called, I certainly see it as this, a relative latecomer in the war on terror. I think Hungary's been catapulted into a radically um, disparate global security environment from what it found itself in uh, during, uh, during and obviously before the transition period. And uh, Hungary's uh, gone, undergone a, a very hasty transition from socialism to a period of political and economic instability, although its democratic process was actually considered oddly smooth and incident-free, uh, to a vastly different geopolitical and international security environment today. Now, I think this is affecting each and every state differently, uh, politically, economically, and socially, but Hungary was compelled to play a game of catch-up, I think, in the, in the security game, in the counterterrorism game, particularly with the US and other members uh, of NATO, other members of the European Union, um, both of which Hungary is a, a comparably new member. So I want to see if I'm time. making any violations of my time here. Yeah. In nine minutes. How many? Oh, okay, <laughs> wonderful. Yeah, so um, since Hungary was also um, part of a much wider United Nations system, its United Nations history is, is quite, uh, is more extensive than, than its, other, uh, its other institutional histories. Um, it was active, engaged, and a supporter uh, of the purposes and missions of the UN uh, in the fight against terrorism, and although maybe it wasn't so much referred to as terrorism, maybe criminal classes, etc. Uh, and um, and commit, uh, it committed the state to formulating its own, its own counterterrorism policies, institutes, and practices while adopting others from abroad. It's this history, I think, that really sets the, the framework for trying to understand where Hungary's counterterrorism uh, policies uh, come from, uh, what, what influences them the most, where they're borrowed from, how they're, how they're enacted, um, and uh, subsequently what their implications are. Um, and so I'm, I'm making the general argument that in Hungary, especially in the post 9-11 period, uh, its CT uh, framework uh, is the result of uh, A, its own political initiatives, uh, B, external pressures from outside of the country, in part maybe the UN, most notably uh, the North Atlantic Treaty Organization, maybe to a lesser extent the European Union, singular states like the US, and now increasingly um, in the rest of my research, when we turn to uh, implications on civil society, now we're turning to the East, we're turning to uh, Russia, turning to Israel, uh, which served as, um, as influences for the formulation of things like civil laws uh, or the, the laws against civil society. <clears throat> now, this chapter seeks to inquire into the nature of this framework, asking to what extent are, are hungry CT laws indigenous? Uh, I have to problematize indigenous, uh, but I already said we have to ask where do they come from, what influences them, is there ambiguity in terms of how terrorism is defined in new CT laws in Hungary, if the law securitizes certain categories of people such as minority groups, Muslim community, Muslim charities, um, other things like uh, civil society organizations that maybe are anti-patriarchal in focus, uh, LGBTQI plus in focus, um, pro-transparency, anti-corruption, um, or other, other categories, uh, then it would be consistent with the US and it would be consistent with some EU states and to a certain extent, uh, it would be consistent with the counterterrorism policies in uh, the developing world that have seen the esta establishment of counterterrorism laws that have been not directed entirely towards terrorism or mitigating terrorism, but turned toward other securitized actors and agents within the country that might pose um, that might pose a threat to the stability of, of power for ruling governments uh, or. Um, existing uh, uh, institutions or systems in the world. Um, 
Now, I proceed by looking at uh, Hungary during the socialist period very briefly, and I follow this by looking at the uh, democratic transition, what I call a nascent security policy period. And I follow this with looking at uh, accession to the Atlantic, uh, the Atlantic Alliance and accession to the EU as um, probably the most significant influences on Hungarian security and counterterrorism policy. And uh, so far, I've looked at, um, or I've taken into account eight, uh, eight institutions. Should I attempt the Hungarian, or do I? <laughs> the Informatio Hivatal, the uh, Alkotman Vedelami Hivatal, the Katonai Nemzat Bistonsági Sogalat, Nemzat Bistonsági Sogalat, Tibek, uh, Tech, the infamous Terra Haritashi Kispont, and um, the protective services and security authorities. Uh, as well, I, uh, I look at the National Action Plan to Combat Terrorism, the elusive and vague uh, action, action plan. So why did Hungary establish counterterrorism counter laws when they have, there has not been a terrorist attack in Hungary? I mentioned the instance of Spain. Uh, the classification or the characterization of Spain as uh, a case of politics as usual. Um, and um, is it about ensuring the protection of lives and properties from terrorist attacks? Uh, is it about the Hungarian government finding a way to reenact old power centered systems of governance where human rights and civil liberties were largely repressed? Uh, the ways of counterterrorism laws in the U.S., U.K., Canada, France, Australia, Kenya, Nigeria, uh, Uganda, and Chad, uh, among other states, provided a platform, I think, on which the Hungari Hungarian government could establish counterterrorism laws in repressing credible opposition to restriction of civil liberties in Hungary, and most notably in the area of civil society. Uh, and this is really the, um, the essence of the research. Uh, and I see, to good point, Hungary has effectively played the terrorist card in spite of its, uh, its terrorism, uh, uh, relatively terrorism-free landscape. Um, this, uh, this research has so far included the uh, about 17 semi-structured interviews with security agents and security professionals in Hungary. Um, as you can imagine, the most difficult of which was the Rendo Sheikh to get a hold of. <laughs> they rebuked me several times, claiming not to be a non-governmental organization. I didn't claim they were, but um, I was uh, able to have a few interviews with Tech, um, one with Tibek, um, and uh, security prof uh, professionals. Uh, sorry, security um, professors and. Um, of lesser importance and uh, lesser interest was my interviews with uh, politicians. Uh, okay, I, I let them do a lot of this while I while I sat there with the reporter. But uh, anyway, this is what the research so far is based on. Again, it's tough to uh, to, to to kind of let this chapter stand alone uh, because it fits in with something much broader. Um, but it it does generally map out the security and counterterrorism policies and frameworks of. Con uh, of Hungary, 1989-2017. Um, it's incomplete. It's 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 pushing on 14,000 words, so it's a bit long. It's time to be complete, but um, I'm happy to share a working a working copy with anybody who might be interested. Obviously, it wasn't feasible to circulate this before the, the conference, with the expectation that people read this. But upon demand, I can certainly deliver this. So, but uh, I welcome any. Uh, questions, hopefully not too, uh, not too uh, pressing or, or difficult, but please. Anyway, thank you thank very you much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. But I think uh, we should collect this, uh, the questions and we, we should uh, open the floor to the discussion after the second presentation. That would be, uh, has more sense, I think. So for me, it was a very interesting topic because uh, one side it shows us the this special new security challenges uh, like uh, counterterrorism and, and uh, terrorism, and the other face is uh, oh, sorry about that. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but this topic can show us a very interesting feature of this. Um, 
what the content there is, but now it's a very up-to-date and very mediatized topic uh, here in Hungary, of course. And it shows us the, the so-called internalization or domestication of the foreign policy. How can we construct the identities here? So I think uh, the discourse of the politicians matters from that point of view because this is how uh, identity construction uh, can take place. Uh, but for me, it was very, very interesting. And it showed us that, uh, again, that new, um, new challenges require cooperation. That, that's what the second presentation is about. Uh, so we open the uh, scene, and we go to a new geographical area, uh, and uh, Eigel, Casanova, we we'll talk, we'll, uh, talk uh, about the Euro-Asian Euro integration. <laughs> Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'm happy here, and I'm honored to be presenting in front of you um, this topic, which is a little bit different from the whole framework on the conference, but I hope it's going to be interesting. And uh, okay, let's start. So uh, I'm going to talk the post Cold War evolution of Eurasia, and mostly I'm going to be uh, focused on this post Soviet Eurasia and all those integration processes that went um, during this more than 25 years. And um, I'm gonna, I'm going to um, do this review, and then I'm going to discuss this final stage of the Eurasian Economic Union, what challenges it faces, um, what advantages and perspective it has, and yeah. So this is it. Let's start. Um, okay. So actually, this this is the content. Uh, of uh, my presentation. Firstly, I'm going to talk about the concept of Eurasianism, which is, I think, uh, very important to mention. Then I'm going to talk about the development of this Eurasian post-Soviet integration, and then I'm going to talk about the Eurasian Economic Union as it is. So, uh, firstly, I think uh, I should start uh, just, sorry, just... I think I first start with the term itself, Eurasia, because it's, it's, it is a highly debatable term, uh, which has two dimensions. Uh, firstly, in that geographical term, which usually is connected with the territories between Europe and Asia. And the second one is that political, ideological, philosophical um, term, meaning uh, which is mostly connected with this, which is also very contradictory, uh, which is, um, um, how to say, which have different perceptions, different understandings, and which were first, which firstly emerged in the Russian Empire, and that's why now we're going to start with the Russian Eurasianism. Uh, so, firstly, this uh, concept of Eurasianism um, it is much older than the collapse of the Soviet Union, as already mentioned. And it can be traced back to the 1920s uh, when Russian immigrants promoted the idea of this Eurasianism. And uh, also, uh, it developed throughout the uh, years during the Soviet Union, uh, one of the proponents of which was Cumulo, for example. And now we, and today we have some neo Eurasianism ideas. But in general, I think it's a very wide topic, and I decided just to uh, make uh, the main points, uh, how we can divide them. Of course, this is not that overwhelming, and the final, uh, these are just what um, I could, um, how to say, differentiate and <laughs> classify, so in order to understand how we can perceive this from different, um, from different authors, from different um, scientists. So, uh, the first one, it is an idea. I'm sorry, can I talk with this because I feel so uncomfortable? <laughs> 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 because really. So, uh, firstly, uh, it is, this one or is it better? Or I think maybe it's okay, okay if I'm going to go and talk like this. It is an idea of cultural dialogue between Europe and Asia, and um, it was mostly um, developed, um, um, how to say, it was mostly one of the proponents of it is. Uh, for example, Gumilov, as I already mentioned, who 
because he was thinking about he was believing in the special place of Russia, uh, which was um, situated between Europe and Asia. And in these terms, also, it could be a bridge, it could play that important role connecting uh, Asia and Europe. At the same time, he was thinking that it also is a very special place, Eurasia, because it was connected to different uh, peoples, uh, for example, Turkic uh, peoples, Orthodox, Slav Slavic people, uh, also different religions, uh, as um, Christianity, uh, Muslim people. So all this uh, cultural, religious, ethnic diversity uh, ref was reflected, uh, were reflected in uh, his works. So generally, what I want to say about the Russian, the Russian Eurasianism that it is the idea of cultural dialogue, it is the definition of the super-ethnic collectivity, as I already mentioned. It is a both ideological and political movement of the 90s of the 20th century. It is an idea of regional integration in the Eurasian territory, which is topical now. And it, it is put forward in opposing to the encroachment of Western civilization, civilization for the sake of the establishment of the Russian world empire, which are more or less that radical views. Uh, uh, yes, but what is important to mention here that it has, though it is uh, Eurasianism as a school, let's say, is accepted in Russian and post-Soviet uh, academia, but uh, it never, uh, been accepted as an official ideology, as an official foreign policy of Russia. Um, yes. Uh, next one, I'm going to talk about the. Oh, okay. So I want to talk about later, but okay. So as if we are considering this Eurasian concept today, and in these uh, conditions of firm establishment and development of Eurasian Economic Union, uh, we should pay we should see that Putin's vision of the Eurasian Economic Union is that uh, we are proposing a model of powerful supranational association capable of becoming one of the poles of the modern world to play an effective bridge role between Europe and the dynamic Asia-Pacific region. So this is a little bit different. So it doesn't, it doesn't have these all common views that were elaborated since 1920s. It is a new one. Uh, and at this moment, this is how the foreign policy of Russia sees the creation of the Eurasian Economic Union uh, officially. Um, next one, I'm going to talk about the Kazakhstani policy of Eurasianism. Uh, it is, um, what is important to note that actually this uh, idea, this concept played a very important role uh, in the establishment and development of the Eurasian integration, but actually it, it is not that popular maybe uh, in the scientific world and in, uh, in general in the international community. And I think that it is very important to also uh, discuss uh, this uh, direction. So for today, uh, it is an official ideology of the country and the focus is to build peace, solidarity and unity among peoples on the basis of morality, spirituality, cultural and historical interactions of people of different ethno-linguistic, cultural and religious backgrounds. What are, it's important to mention that Kazakhstan is also situated, uh, uh, let's say, 90% uh, of the territories of Kazakhstan belongs to Asia, though 10% of the territory belongs to Europe. So it has that also that geographical situation when it is located between Asia and uh, Europe. And it is trying, plus, uh, due to this uh, Soviet heritage, there are quite a lot of different nationalities in the in Kazakhstan. So the policy, the government of the country, trying to create this policy of tolerance, inter-ethnic dialogue, and etc. Uh, so uh, one of the main proponents, of course, was the President Nazarbayev, who, uh, since the collapse of the Soviet Union, he was uh, proposing his ideas uh, and he, at different meetings. And uh, his first propo proposal, let's say, of the, 19, uh, of the Eurasian creation of the, the Eurasian Economic Union was in 1994, which later were developed in different books and different articles. On the basis of this uh, different 
uh, works, uh, we can uh, define these four basic uh, principles that were proposed by Kazakhstan policy or by Nazar Bayev. So first of all, it is the idea of creating this union on economic pragmatism. Then, voluntary participation of member countries who must decide independently whether they want to be locked in the, or within their own borders or join the globalized world. Principles of equality, mutual respect of sovereignty and not to interfere in the domestic affairs of others. And principles of consensus of, to, of all participants without giving up, giving up national sovereignty. So, uh, in this case, this Kazakhstan idea of Eurasianism became an official policy, uh, foreign policy and initiative of uh, promoting this Eurasian integration of the post-Soviet space, which is different from the Russian one. So, <clears throat> um, these are, so I think that uh, these are the main ideas that I wanted to um, show. Uh, I think it's also good to see all these um, post-Soviet uh, space to better understand the situation. As you can see, Kazakhstan is a landlocked as a land country which also sees to use these benefits uh, being at the crossroads of Europe and Asia. And that's why it was one of the, this geographical location was one of the most reasons of promoting uh, this idea of Eurasian integration. So, uh, the next step, uh, I think we should um, go, we should be, we should discuss the history, so how this integration started and developed throughout these years of the post-Soviet space since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Um, so to understand at what stage or let's say how successful or not successful or efficient it is now um, after 25 years. Uh, so. Uh, the first uh, attempt uh, after collapse, after disintegration, was maintaining all those relations among the, uh, the great number of countries. So the Commonwealth of Independent States was established. I think this is a very nice, um, <laughs> how to say, this is a very nice timeline of major events that you can see throughout um, these years. Uh, it's uh, mostly connected with the Eurasian Economic Union, but I'm going to uh, go beyond the borders. So, the Commonwealth of Independent States, which uh, included all the former states except Baltic states, and later Georgia joined, uh, as uh, Georgia joined, but later in 2008 it um, left the organization. And uh, it is also very important to know that as uh, the sovereigns newly independent states that they were not that much interested in joining new integration processes because of this uh, moment, momentum of gaining independence and of course um, all of them were quite most of them were quite suspicious about new integrations at that moment so they were not you know, they were, there are not there is no such a big you know desire to create something new um, on that and post Soviet basis. However, um, understanding, I think, that the countries had that, those very strong connections, economical, functional connections, that some economic integration, uh, they understood that some economic integration would benefit, uh, and some processes started. So, uh, let's start. <laughs> uh, the, uh, the only thing I want to say about the Commonwealth of Independent States is that actually after two and a half decades it showed itself that not that efficient because uh, on the post-Soviet space there were a lot of different conflicts, there were a lot of even worse revolutions, that's why it couldn't, um, how to say, it showed itself as an inefficient, as countries, they couldn't regulate all these issues on that basis and later on like um, they come the understanding, the realization that some other or body, some other integration or, or organizations could help in tackling these problems, these issues. Um, so, in 1995, Russia and Belarus created the Customs Union and Kazakhstan and Kyrgyzstan joined it later. Uh, I'm going to go through the main uh, parts. So, 
which is the next step was the Treaty on the Customs Union and Common Economic Space when Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Russia, and Tajikistan joined, uh, which is very important. In 2000, the Treaty on the Establishment of the Eurasian Economic Community, Belarus, Kazakhstan, Kyrgyzstan, Russia, all five countries, uh, started to work. And this was, let's say, the main, the first main attempt to create those that um, economic integration of the post Soviet state, preparing countries for further, um, creating further customs union, um, economic space, and, uh, and at a later step, the Eurasian Economic Union. Um, it's also very important to know that um, at the same time, um, the were the creation, the was the uh, establishment of the Collective Security Duty Organization after collapse of the Soviet Union, because uh, okay, uh, in some some expert or in some um, opinion in some other opinions of experts they consider it as a opponent of nature but I think it's in my opinion it's not that evident because most of this uh, organization was uh, seeking to preserve all those security issues on the post Soviet states. But actually, after some years, it also showed itself as not that efficient because the, um, the conflicts were going on, for example, in Armenia. Uh, Armenia and Azerbaijan had that um, conflict on the Gordon Karabakh, and actually, this organization couldn't tackle these issues. Another organization, which is also important, in 2001, uh, Shanghai uh, Cooperation Organization was created. Uh, where China was engaged. So firstly, one of the main um, ideas of this organization purposes was to create also this between Russia, Central Asia and China, create this dialogue for security, for further economic um, economic uh, relations. But in fact, it's, I think that uh, this organization didn't develop in that way it could because uh, there was kind of clash of interest with Russia and China on that post Soviet Central Asia. So this organization just mostly, let's say, preserved itself as a political club and a political dialogue of the countries. And I think that the bilateral relations were mostly prevailing that the relations among this organization. One minute. Okay. I'm sorry, guys. <laughs> I'm sorry. This is a very huge and um, broad topic. So, finally, <laughs> during all these things, as you can see, I think, uh, in 2015, the Eurasian Economic Union finally uh, created uh, the three members, uh, Kazakhstan, Russia, and um, Belarus were the core members of the countries, and later Armenia and Azerbaijan uh, uh, joined this organization. And as I don't have a lot of time, I'm just going to go through the main ideas, the main conclusions I came uh, throughout my research. This is what I was already talked about. Um, this is the Eurasian Economic Union, what it is now. This is an international organization for regional economic integration, which provides free movement of goods, services, capital, and labor. What is important, the model of the integration was taken from the European one, European Union, and which is very debatable in this academia, in, in the papers, uh, and some of the experts think that it can be compared, and some of them know it cannot be compared. So this is a very interesting topic. To, um, I mean, if you're interested for further, you can read, because there are a lot of interesting ideas and opinions about, about that. Uh, so here are the member states of the Euro, uh, five member states. And uh, I'm going to just uh, briefly talk about the main specific you know, features that today the actors of the Eurasian Economic Union are post-transitional economies, which is evident. Um, the, EU, uh, the EIU institutions continue to privilege national over supranational decision-making condition by the extent to which member states are able to harmonize their political and economic interests. So today we can say that these supranational institutions in this Eurasian Economic Union are not that strong. And it's more, not that supranational, but let's say intergovernmental organization. 
Also, the dominance of political leaders in the integration processes is very important because the main drivers, Kazakhstan, Belarus, and Kazakhstan, were the main drivers of this integration were the leaders of these countries. And in case the change of the leader of one of the countries, we can, you know, the how to say, we cannot know what will happen after because it will depend on the course. Okay. And the asymmetrical <laughs> relations no, with the EU. Okay, no. this is the challenges I wanted to outline, and the advantages and opportunities. So this is it. Yeah, basically, <laughs> we can discuss it later during our questions. Thank I'm you sorry about all that, but if you are interested, you can ask questions. So thank you. It was very interesting to see that how many things can be mean. Oh, sorry. So, okay. Uh, thank you for your presentation. It was a really interesting one. And uh, I think it's interesting how many, and very fascinating, how many things can be mean by integration and efficiency of integration. And uh, what, what are the ways? How can we realize mutual gains? And, as Igo said, that the European integration served as a model in the 90s, but uh, that's debatable how yeah. can we uh, model uh, this kind of integration. Uh, the European integration was based on, um, I think, on, this is a kind of problem solving integration, and the Eurasian mm -hmm. integration Thanks. is based on ideas and desires of foreign policies, basically. But there are some mutual interests, mm -hmm, so mm -hmm. it's very interesting. Um, and thank you for for your participation as well. If you have any questions, <coughs> please ask. One question. Yes, of course. such a refreshing uh, change of topics. <laughs> I guess we were all tired from hearing all the things, thing, so this was very <clears throat> refreshing in that sense. I have a question regarding uh, counter-terrorism or the counter-terrorism measures. I can see that I may have misunderstood you because there was something which I found odd and uh, it was probably because I misunderstood your statement. So I'd like to mm, repeat what I thought you said. Then in the case that if you did uh, mean it, I would uh, like to ask you a follow-up question regarding to that. When talking about the Hungarian increase in counter-terrorism measures, you, um, and saying that it, that has been done without uh, serious terrorist attacks in Hungary, you've uh, drawn a parallel with Spain, saying it was the same process? That's how I understood it. Maybe I understood it wrong. Yeah, yeah, I dropped Spain in there rather um, uh, hastily, and and maybe it didn't it didn't find its place in there very very well, but um, that's the part where it ties into the broader research where uh, I look at the intersection between civil society uh, relations and counterterrorism or security policy in Hungary, and um, why I turned to Spain and I look to Spain as a as a, a case uh, because um, unlike cases uh, in Nigeria, Uganda. Uh, Uzbekistan, Kyrgyzstan, uh, even cases uh, in, in the United States, and I uh, am ashamed to say, even in instances in Canada, although Canada very much falls quite to the side uh, and, and is not at all relatable to the situation in Nigeria and Somalia and what, what not. But, um, you, see, uh, you see the inaction of sweeping counterterrorism measures, stringent counterterrorism measures that are being used to outright attack NGOs, civil society, civil society organizations in these countries. Now, of course, the United States doesn't fall quite to that category as well, but it, certainly in India, Somalia, uh, Uzbekistan is one of the worst cases, Nigeria, you see this. Now, Spain, I raised Spain as, a, as an interesting case because Coalesce in 2010, reporting on, on uh, the Spanish case, found that, as I said, quote-unquote, politics as usual in Spain, despite a very devastating terrorist attack for that country, despite separatist movements, and the ongoing threat of terrorism in the country and in and around Europe, Spain hasn't turned to any exceptional counterterrorism measures at all. Spain has no Patriot Act. 
Spain has no no uh, sweeping internal policies or has no DBEC, no tex, no no uh, new homeland security departments, anything like this. That's why I put Spain in there. Although I I realize now that when I drop that that country's name in my sentence, it kind of found a. Uh, failed to find an anchoring, so that's why I mentioned the Spanish case. Now then the idea is, where does Hungary fit in this? Is Hungary a Nigeria? Is Hungary a Somalia? Is it a Spain? Is it politics as usual in Hungary? If uh, Depending on how you define politics as usual in Hungary. Uh, is it a case where the counterterrorism policies in Hungary aren't being used at all to coerce or co-op civil society organizations and NGOs? Uh, is there a positive relationship between the government and civil society? Obviously, we already know <laughs> the answer to that. Uh, um, but is it positive in the context of counterterrorism? Are they involved in the dialogue? Are they involved in, in the formulation? Is it is C are CTMs having uh, increased? Uh, are they negatively impacting CSOs and NGOs? Is it raising their operational costs? Is it li limiting their capacities, etc.? So where does Hungary fall? along this, this spectrum or within this landscape. That's, that's basically what I was saying. Okay, that's my very long answer to your, your question. So thanks. But is there a follow-up to that? No, no. Yeah, and there is I another question. Yeah. Okay. yeah, so. <laughs> I guess you but have I to. I think yeah. it will be OK, because I think it'll be the fine. air conditioning so is off. I, I have two questions, so, yeah. one, one for uh, each of you. Yeah. The first one about counterterrorism. When we think about uh, the Eastern example of Russia, um, does it really fall within counterterrorism? Because, I mean, for me, the Russian argument is not that, you know, um, these kind of things that they're banning are actually causing terrorism. They're saying that they impede their way of life. And for me, that's a different argument to saying they're going to cause terrorism. They're shutting down the Church of Scientology, but I don't think it's because Scientologists are terrorists. So, you know, my point of view is that I agree with you, and it's definitely a really important question to think about, but whether or not it's quite counter-terrorism for me, this is a separate thing. Definitely government, civil society, yes. Counter-terrorism, I don't know. It's definitely a model people are following, mm -hmm. but I'm not sure about that. That's the first one. And the second one, it was interesting about uh, Kazakhstan that you kind of, for me, it was a very positive formulation of this position and this ideology, whereas... I know a lot of people see it in a very negative way and see it as a, a struggle being between Russia and China and how, how on earth do you find a place for yourself between these huge powers and how do you find development without depending on them. So it's kind of interesting. I just wanted to ask why you went so positive, not to criticize it, but it's, it's just very interesting because I haven't heard this positive framing before. So. Okay. Right. You've really crystallized the essence of the research. It's good because counterterrorism policies are never formulated, never implemented neatly. There's nothing clean and neat about CTMs. Um, what works in one country certainly may not work in another country. It may have entirely different implications. And this is the this is the gray zone. Um, what what exactly is a counterterrorism policy or measure in the context of the terrorism definition or the terrorism outlook? Um, and and how where is the danger in uh, in formulating policy, implementing policy and measures, and depending on where where it came from, where it was, what what influenced it? Um, there's an there's an inherent danger in in exporting the Patriot Act, just simply supplanting an entire policy and replanting it in Nigeria without taking any consideration for the political, social, and the legal uh, context of that country. Uh, the same can be said with a, con with a country like Hungary, with uh, um, an authoritarian past, a communist past, um, dare I say xenophobic, uh, semi-xenophobic society, maybe, but what country isn't xenophobic in a, in a way? Um, what's the danger in formulating counterterrorism policies in a country like that? Uh, particularly when you combine that with uh, certain government um, domestic views uh, about what constitutes a threat in the country. Um, now, again, depending on, on where you're from and who you are, that might sit very comfortably with you. Maybe uh, a, a hardline conservative in, in the outbacks of Russia might be perfectly content with everything under the sun being defined as terrorism, so long as it 
it, it uh, upsets the stability of the country or whatever. Scientology, you said. Um, now, when I speak to the politicians in this country, um, their language is so uncomfortable. Bridging civil society and connecting it with migration, connecting it with human rights, connecting it with, like, with, with, with what they call human rights fundamentalists, I don't know what a human rights fundamentalist is, with people that overinterpret human rights, I don't know how you overinterpret human rights either, and saying that this all constitutes not terrorism, but extremism. Well, the same thing is happening in Russia. Uh, now, extremism is not the same as, as terrorism. In fact, I'd say 99.9% .9 of the world's population is extreme in one way or another. That's just by nature, by human nature, We're, um, because we have differing opinions. So you really capture the essence of the research, and then when you take those counterterrorism measures and then you redirect them towards whatever is a perceived threat in the, in the country, um, this is, this is the, the, the highly problematic uh, area. Okay, can I continue? Okay, uh, concerning this uh, um, question, uh, yes, of course, I think that um, one of the issues is that there are uh, two different camps, let's say Western and post-Soviet, let's say Russian, um, opinions about the future, I mean, the, the meaning of this Eurasian Economic Union. And as for Kazakhstan, as I already mentioned, this is a country which is landlocked and connected uh, and situated between the, how to say, one of the most most um, powerful states in the world, Russia and China, it has to use its own policy, right? It has to use its own um, policy of this integration, their initiatives. And let's say, I think it is like this. We are ready to integrate. We want to, this integration because it will be beneficial, really, in that economic terms. And being landlocked, we understand that we should use our um, location as the crossroad between um, the Asia and, Euro and um, Europe. But at the same time, it gives these limits to this integration, showing what we see under this project, what we um, in what we would see in this project and what are our ideas and aspirations in joining this union. This is it. There is another question, uh, two questions, yes, please. To Idol, uh, thank you. Of course, you came to talk to historians, so we are trying now to pull you back in time. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> because one of the first slides where you mentioned the concept of Eurasianism in Russia that it dates back to 1920, I'm not certainly an expert on Russia in the 19th century, but to my knowledge, it's a concept that developed in 19th century, in fact. That during the Russian Empire, there were two opposing concepts, one mm -hmm. that was looking towards Westmore and the other one that was looking towards Eurasia. Mm -hmm. So maybe it's not interesting for you, but for us to, to <laughs> contemplate on that fact, on the historic roots of, of, uh, of Eurasia. Oh, okay, uh, should I answer? So, okay, <laughs> okay. so actually, <laughs> uh, actually, uh, as I already mentioned, looking through all these um, papers and articles about this Eurasianism, there, there are a lot of opinions, there are a lot of different works and a lot of ideas. And as you mentioned, yes, there are different ideas about that one of like opposing the Western world and creating something, you know, some own Eurasian civilization. And the other one is uh, the other, as you mentioned. So actually, I wouldn't, I wanted to limit, oh, I wanted to limit what I was presenting. I agree that there are different ideas about that. That this is what, what I was presenting, if these are more or less like topical to the today's yeah. realities, maybe that's why I missed that. Um, meaning missed that opinions and ideas but thank you very much for telling me yeah i'd like to add a longer comment on the counterterrorism topic if that's okay uh, first of all uh, i would like to say that uh, starting the counterterror topic after 89 it's a bit problematic because in hungary uh, the counterterror efforts began uh, in the 70s so there was uh, one incident in, in memory service in 1971 
when there was a very costly situation and the authorities were totally unprepared, uh, physically, uh, legally, and so on. So after that incident, uh, there were uh, uh, many steps taken. Specialist units uh, were established uh, to fight uh, potential domestic terrorist uh, threats. Also, legal steps were taken so they can be put on uh, trial. And also, uh, as a, a main um, concept, uh, state security apparatus was uh, the main uh, force that was uh, fighting uh, this uh, uh, potential threat. So it was the uh, second directorate of the third main directorate of the Interior Ministry, the Counterintelligence Service, which in the 80s uh, uh, was very active uh, regarding uh, the potential uh, Arab and leftist uh, terrorism, uh, which tried to find its ways into Hungary. Uh, but uh, I have to say that as uh, a good socialist uh, country, we also provided some support. So, for example, Carlos de Shekel was uh, uh, here uh, for holidays for a shorter period in the 80s, as far as we know. Maybe he was here more than once, I don't know. Uh, and in the 80s, uh, the efforts, which began in the 70s, were uh, even uh, more intensive. A, a specialist unit was established, uh, which uh, also got uh, specialist equipment uh, to fight uh, such potential uh, threats, as it was seen later in the 80s. Uh, this, this was a, a very uh, wise precaution, because uh, in other parts of the socialist bloc, uh, there were problems of this kind. Uh, after uh, 89, uh, there was this apparatus which was more or less undisturbed, and, uh, uh, but the threats were uh, different. So, uh, for example, state security was uh, dissolved and the organizations that you listed uh, were established uh, on the ruins of the Interior Ministry's uh, third uh, main uh, directorate. And uh, yeah, uh, counterterrorism after that in the 90s wasn't nobody's uh, main uh, topic. It was mainly the uh, topic of the National Security uh, Agency in Hungary, and the Biztonsági Hivatal. Uh, and also the police and other agencies uh, were uh, participating uh, in uh, counterterrorist action when necessary. It was luckily. Uh, not uh, uh, that necessary. There was a serious incident in, I think, in 1991, where leftist uh, German terrorists tried to attack uh, Jewish migrants from uh, the Soviet Union who were on their way to Israel. And two uh, Hungarian policemen were seriously injured uh, in that incident. It was a quite a large bomb. They didn't manage to uh, initiate the explosion at the right time because. They would have then we would talk about terrorism in Hungary at that time. And yeah, uh, after 9-11, uh, uh, there were uh, interesting uh, developments. Hungary on the international uh, field tried to uh, take part uh, in the international effort. We sent troops to Afghanistan and to Iraq. And uh, also the Hungarian military established uh, its special forces branch which uh, participated in Afghanistan in counter-terrorist action as far as we can know. Um, I can't tell you any specifics because as far as I know it's still classified, but yeah, uh, we know uh, that in Afghanistan the Hungarian Special Operations Forces were really active uh, and probably they could still be, I don't know. So I only wanted to add Sounds like I have to make room for a co-author's name <laughs> on my work eventually. But I, I would have to ask him, to what, to what extent is this independent uh, security policy during the 1970s, the 1980s? Because this is, this is within the confines of uh, a socialist country that's, that's following the Soviet Union. Well, I don't want to say following the Soviet Union, but it's within a, a particular camp, right? So, uh, and then is this... Is this the same the same security environment as we see today? Because it's sort of operating in its own its own world, right? Uh, you know, the borders being yeah, uh, but here. This so is a organic development. Mm -hmm. 
It begins in the 1970s and develops and develops and develops. Yeah. Tech had its predecessor, it, it was towards pass, it was only uh, uh, tasked with uh, counterterrorism action, they didn't collect anything. Uh, the part uh, which Tech now has as intelligence unit was originally uh, in the Alcott Mayweather Hibata and so on. So it's a pretty difficult picture, but. Uh, if you want to go to the starting point, you have to go back right into the 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. And I include a section on the socialist, uh, the socialist period, but it's really interesting either way because then you can talk about the historical vestiges of a security policy of what the, the, the scaffolding of a, of a, well it wasn't scaffolding, they were our institutions operating, but you can talk about a, a, a pre-existing framework for what can serve as as uh, counterterrorism institutions today, which could be good or bad because it, it comes and emerges, it stems from a system of, of centralized power. Uh, and today I see when we map out the, the security institutions, the, the intelligence services and, and information offices, whatnot, you see a re-centralization of all of these offices underneath the, the, the prime minister. Uh, uh, so either way, it's very interesting. But like I said, I think I have to make room for a co-author's name on my on my work afterwards. But but uh, yeah, there's there's a lot to explore in the socialist period, and um, I tried to engage in the um, uh, the it's the University of Maryland's global terrorism database. I tried to look up Hungary and try to find. And there's nothing. There, there's I think they have two incidences and the or three or something like this. And of course, it's uh, it's past uh, 1990 uh, or 1991. I can't remember what the date was, but um, uh, and then there's a, a second really notable uh, terrorism database. I think that's run out of um, Australia. I think it's it's Melbourne maybe or Adelaide, Melbourne. I think, but they didn't have anything on Hungary either. So trying to find the incidences. Um, uh, is is uh, difficult. I know of left wing left wing like incidences back in the seventies, the eighties, but I have to admit that the Hungarian language and the information, uh, the data, you know, um, sitting somewhere deep in uh, some buildings way over over in that direction, I, this is a barrier to me. Um, I have to do uh, uh, my best to conduct interviews using my my very poor Hungarian and trying to look through documents and this is this is tough so I think this is sometimes I always joke that you're better equipped to do my research for me but yet I do the best I can but yeah perhaps uh, a few uh, a, a discussion afterward would be nice and maybe some sure. some direction but thank you for that no you are the right place to explore <laughs> this, yeah. this is yeah. of your topics. Thing. thank you to everybody uh, for listening to this um, quite interesting panel. And uh, we don't have too much time. That's why I would like to open the floor for the closing remarks. Well, let's clap. Yeah. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. So thank you very much. And then very briefly, because dinner is waiting, uh, very briefly let me close uh, the conference. Um, without any big uh, uh, summary. So please uh, listen to this very, very, very short um, um, closing, um, closing remark. Uh, we had a two-day conference um, in which we had seven panels. Uh, in the seven panels, we had uh, 23 presentations uh, from 12 different countries altogether uh, concerning the uh, countries, original countries of the uh, participants. Uh, plus, we had two excellent keynote speeches uh, at this conference, uh, and um, at, at least as much uh, important as this is that we had uh, we had very good and very uh, lively, uh, vivid and very um, uh, ex um, excellent uh, discussions. Discussions, which are actually in some way the, the best parts of the conferences, you know, um, in, in in a certain sense, definitely. So, without any uh, uh, big um, uh, uh, summary, let me just uh, thank everybody 
uh, all the presenters, all the uh, students who came to this conference, all the panel chairs who did an ex excellent job uh, at these conferences, uh, at the, these two days, um, uh, during these two days at this conference. And, um, and of course, um, definitely we have to uh, <clears throat> again thank um, the Central European University, the History Department at Central European University for hosting uh, this conference. And uh, by, uh, by saying this, let me again express our great hope uh, that this university uh, will be located uh, in Budapest, functioning in Budapest, not only today, uh, but next year and again next year and uh, in, the, in the future to come. Uh, because as we know, as, uh, this is the kind of issue which we mentioned already at the beginning of the conference, uh, uh, this ongoing um, uh, crisis about the, uh, the, 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 the situation of the Central European University is still not resolved, but there is some hope um, right now that by the negotiations, after the negotiations, which are going on right now, uh, there will be a satisfactory um, a solution and the Central European University will be able uh, to function in Budapest forever. So uh, after this, I only have one uh, important uh, announcement to make, uh, uh, that the, lunch, the dinner will be at 7 o'clock uh, in Vakvaryu restaurant, which is very close uh, um, to see you. So then we will uh, keep together and in different groups we will um, uh, go there. Perhaps um, some of you uh, will see whether you can go back to the hotel or not. Um, maybe not, not so much. Time is a little <coughs> <laughs> too little in this case, um, but, but we'll see and we, will, we, we can negotiate this. Right? <laughs> so thank you very much again. Thank you and bye bye.